Hello everyone, Earl Henderson, Primordial Defense. Thank you for watching. I have another Monday quarterback video for you. This video comes from the YouTube channel Police Body Cam Videos. Sometimes um, it can be difficult to find the originating source of a video. A lot of times agencies will release videos through their own um, YouTube channel or they will release it through their Facebook page or they'll have their website having the video on there or it could be in some states the uh, like New Jersey they have a website from the Attorney General's office that has these videos Chicago has a civilian police uh, office of accountability website that they've had videos on so it's it's different all across the nation where you can find these videos at. Some agencies don't have a YouTube page with the video on it. Some agencies will have a YouTube page, but they will have the video unlisted, so it never shows up when you look at their page. You have to go find a news release article from the agency that happens to have a hyperlink in it, click on it, then it directs you to their YouTube page to be able to watch the unlisted video. So I don't know what's going on with this video. Um, it's actually been a couple days since I found this video and I actually did a couple of takes on this video and, and actually one take and I um, abandoned that one and this is my second take on it. So it's been a couple of days and I can't remember um, why it is I, I don't have the originating source, but I had to end up uh, screen recording this video from the police body cam videos YouTube page and I've had to do that before on some other ones um, but those were different YouTube pages like police activity and police overwatch that I ended up looking those at um, so if you like the videos that's on my channel you can also go to those other channels as well they actually show a lot of the same videos they don't do any commentary like I do or anything like that but they just show the videos and they don't even show, a lot of times, the full um, release from the agency. They'll just do snippets from the video. So if you don't like listening to the commentary um, and wanting to get straight to the meat and potatoes, wanting to get straight to the shooting and the, and the blood and guts, you can check out um, some of those other channels and they get straight to the point. But anyway, I wanted to give credit where credit was due since this is coming from another YouTube page. Um, also, this video does not happen to have a spokesperson from the agency. Typically, these community briefing videos or critical incident videos will have a spokesperson explaining the events going on, etc. This doesn't have that. So, I have to give you some background information on it as we go. If you look at the lower left, you will also notice that this is a 39 minute video. That's freaking long. So I'm not going to be doing the typical play the entire video in its entirety, go back and talk about stuff. That's a little too long to be doing that. So I'll be pausing intermittently throughout this video and talking about things as they're going on and explaining things and then talking about things that I think that were done right and or done wrong. So this is in um, New Mexico. Uh, the pursuit ends up ending in Corner Clines, I believe it is. Um, the Bernalillo, I don't know how to pronounce that, Bernalillo County District Attorney um, in this news article that I talked about. So it happened in this county. Um, and it ended in Torrance County. I'm sorry, hold on, no. Yeah, so Santa Fe, I don't know, it's, God dang, it's, it's multiple places. So his pursuit ended up ending in Torrance County in a, in a place called um, Corners Klein. And this started in Santa Fe County at a Starbucks. 
And so this is what you're seeing right here. This is the drive through window of a Starbucks. And they're robbing the place. They're trying to steal from them. So I'll go ahead and hit play. And then I'll, I'll pause here and there to talk about stuff. Also, uh, there's two people in the vehicle. It is um, Jacob Montoya and it's like Chris, Christy or Crystal or something like that. Let me, let me look real quick. I've got a couple different articles pulled up. So there can be a lot of stuff to scroll through. Um, Christy Demas. Demas. I, I don't know how to pronounce it. It's D-I-M-A-S. She's from Albuquerque, 29 years old. So it's two people in this vehicle. And uh, they're robbing the Starbucks. Of course, there's no audio from this um, security cam footage here. You see the gun here and back it up some you see a green um, light right there I'm going to say that that is probably a laser beam um, a lot of these dumbasses are obsessed with beams as they call it they think they put a little laser beam on their gun you know they're gonna be able to snipe the balls off a of gnat at a thousand yards <laughs> um, of course when it comes to pistols I, I never advocate putting a laser on them um, because you just end up fishing for the laser especially in daylight hours sometimes that can be extremely hard to pick up um, and they don't really offer you that much of an advantage the only time I could actually see maybe there being an advantage for having a laser on a pistol as if you're doing shield work. Um, other than that, the only type of illumination type of device that needs to be on your pistol is a flashlight. Lasers, I just don't see a lot of benefit in them. Like I said, a lot of times, you know, you end up trying to fish for the laser and figure out where it's pointed at, especially during daytime, if you can even see it. It's just, it's just so much faster to look through your sights to gain to gain a sight picture on a target but anyway uh, these dummies they they love the beams and a lot of it has to deal with rap videos which is the same reason why a lot of these idiots love the AR pistols and the AK pistols or as they like to call them choppas um, or Draco get that Draco bruh so um, They're just, they're just mimicking what they see in the rap videos, what they see their favorite little idols uh, carrying around. And the laser beams is something that they're all infatuated with. And some of them are so fucking stupid that they don't understand that the laser has windage and elevation on it. And you have to adjust the damn thing. And I remember having a, a conversation with a little street thug once. Um... He was, I don't know, I forgot who it was too, but he was telling me about uh, having a beam on his gun. And um, I asked him, I was like, well, how'd you, because he lived in, um, he lived in Louisville and, and he was young too. He was like 15, 16. And I remember asking him like, well, how'd you sight this thing in? And he's like, what do you mean? I said, the laser, like, how'd you sight it in after you put it on? Like, you can't, I, don't, I mean, I highly doubt you went to a gun range with this gun. He goes, I'll just put it on there. I said, yeah, but you got to sight them in. Like, where'd you go to do that at? Because I hear I am thinking in my head, like, he's in some alley somewhere in, in Louisville, you know, shooting this gun, trying to get it sighted in. This dude had no idea what the hell I was talking about. It was beyond him that you could 
adjust how the laser moves left and right up and down. <laughs> no clue whatsoever. Which is fine by me because, you know, he's going to be less accurate. But, um, and there was someone else too that, that uh, I had learned about that had uh, put a laser on their gun and they had mentioned it. And same thing, like it was beyond them that you can adjust the damn laser um, <laughs> to, to actually have your bullets landing where you want them. So there's no telling how many dumbasses are out there who go buy these little lasers and they put them on the gun and they have no idea that you have to adjust the windage and elevation on these things. And I just point the little laser beam and, and start pulling the trigger. Anyway, uh, but that's what I think he has right there. I think he has a laser on the end of his gun there. Of course, you can see that she sees the gun. Her hands are up. She doesn't want to get shot. And here's the, here's the interesting thing, too. They're in a vehicle. You could very easily just walk away from the fucking window and get completely out of there. But this is, you know, uh, a, a response to deadly stimuli. Fight, flight, or freeze. She's obviously not fighting. She's not running. She's freezing. She's afraid. And that happens. But logically, like... Yeah, he could crawl through this window. He'd have to get out of his car and then crawl through the window. But you could just very easily just turn and walk away. Go run out the exit door. Go run across the street. Get the safety. And this interaction, like he's just sitting there, rubbing his chin, you know, as if he's waiting on his coffee. <laughs> Alright, so now we get into the pursuit stuff. Um, the, the pursuit is very long. I'm not going to sit here for the whole 30 plus minutes of this police chase. I will hit the skip button and go through a lot of it. I'll stop at some key points along the way, but we're we're not sitting here listening to over 30 fucking minutes of sirens. It's not happening. I don't know the time frame of which this is occurring, like how long after the robbery occurred does this pick up um how long he's been going on like this because it just starts abruptly so can't give you any insight on time frames at this point I hate those speed humps. I hate these things with a passion.
All right. So here's another officer up here. Who's going to attempt to use a spike strip? So obviously it fails because he is able to avoid it by going into this flat area over here and driving around it. Um, spike strips, spike strips are great. Um, once you can deflate tires, it really affects that person's ability to drive at higher speeds, and then eventually the the tire disintegrates and they're just driving around on a rim, and then it makes it really really difficult for them to drive at high speeds and even um, maneuver the vehicle effectively. But the tactic that he's using is not the greatest. So he has parked his vehicle in a turnout right here. Or pull out, whatever the terminology is. And has left one whole lane completely open. And has this lane right here. Plus the side of the road as potential space for him to have to cover with this little tiny object. You have to think about your spacing, your your environment when setting these things up. So could he have found a better spot? Yes, he could have found a better spot. If we go forward some, let's see here, where was it? It wasn't too far away from here. Right here could have been a good spot to use he could have used this driveway here to pull his cruiser into maybe even pull it out a little bit and and block this lane and then have this tree right here he could have very quickly threw that thing out in the middle of the road and then the operator of the vehicle is either going to have to make the choice to a swerve left and hit the police car which is going to stop him or swerve right and then hit this tree which is going to stop him right up before this road sign right here uh, this could have been another potential spot if he just would have come up a little bit further parked his cruiser directly in the road here diagonally um, with this road sign here that way if the person wanted to try to swerve right and go around the vehicle, he's going to run the risk of running into this sign and then also run the risk of actually going up this hill some and, and potentially hitting what looks like a, a big ass rock. Or he'd have to swerve left and then run the risk of either hitting this sign or it looks like there's kind of a, um, a bit of a depression here, very uneven ground. Uh, could have had the potential of bottom, bottoming out and um, getting stuck in a potential disc, uh, ditch right here. This spot right here, where he performs it at, I mean, this is practically another little turnout section or pullout section. It's very flat and, and easy for a vehicle to, to maneuver around. So this is not the greatest place to be trying to set up a spike strip. He could have done it a little bit far uh, forward where we just looked at and then going down you know, let's go the other way going on down um this doesn't look like the greatest spot um and then get into here was you know potential um places for him to go out so really um Going backwards would have been the better spots to go that I pointed out. Uh, the spot he chose was not the greatest. So 
So they was on some type of like side road. Um, now they start to get onto the interstate area. So, I don't know what's going on, why the other camera had gone out, and why we're now switching to this. But this dude's obviously at the police station, or sheriff's office, whatever officer he is. Um, and it starts from this angle. Maybe this is a shared lot for police and fire, maybe? Because these look like potential fire trucks over here. Or ambulances. I don't know. So it could be a shared building. So he turns the siren on while he's in the parking lot. And one of two things is going on here. One, he could have been... Um, utilizing a smart siren and push the little rocker switch all the way to the right and the smart sirens are pretty cool you have multiple buttons on there that you can turn different lights and stuff on but then you have this little rocker switch kind of like a light switch that has three positions and the first one you know typically it's set up where it turns on rear lights the second one turns on rear and front lights and then the third one turns on all the lights plus the siren so it's possible that he just you know was turning his lights on getting prepared once he hits the roadway just simply moved it too too far to the right and obviously didn't need sirens in the parking lot so clicked it back to the left one or it's possible that he intentionally turned the sirens on to be able to get the gate to open so there are some gates out there that have sensors that will open um when the the tone of a siren is in front of it the certain um megahertz of of sound will it'll pick up on that and it'll actually open there's some apartment complexes that have gates that um, are set up to where you know if an ambulance fire truck police car pull in and they've got the sirens turned on that gate will open for them that way if they don't know the code they can get in and so i don't know if that's what's on this gate if it has a, that type of sensor or not i have no idea but just thought i'd throw that in there Useless information, I know.
Okay, so up until this point, this officer has just been catching up to where they are. I don't know what he's in, but he is floating. Um, I can't tell by the hood design or anything like that. It looks like he's sitting a little bit higher. He could be in, he could be in an SUV. Um, I don't know what he's in, but damn, he's floating. Um but yeah, like this whole time from, let's see here, we're at the 23 minute mark. Uh, and it went pretty far back to the seven minute mark. So from the seven minute mark to the 23 minute mark is literally this dude just getting to where they're at. That's a reality for a lot of sheriff's offices and state police slash highway patrol in this country. It's something I don't think a lot of city folks um, think about. And certainly I don't think it's something that a lot of city officers think about who've, who've, who've only been in the city and, and never, you know, been out in the county. And if they have, it's, you know, been very few times. Uh, but this is this is the reality like there's parts of the country it's just wide open spaces and it can be a minute several minutes for a deputy or a trooper to cover a large area get from point a to point b you know like you know when you think about troopers being out there by themselves or highway patrol being out there by themselves their backup, if something happens to them, their backup could be 30 minutes away because it takes so freaking long for someone to get out there to them. Now, this part of the country, going out west, there's a lot of nice straight roads out that way. Not a whole lot of curves. At least, you know, in this particular area, I haven't seen a whole lot of curves. You come here around Kentucky, here in the south, it's not like that. There's a lot of curves out here on these country roads. Um, the interstates can be mostly uh, straight. But um, you go on some other roads, like this This is not This is not an interstate. It's some type of highway. It's not an interstate, though. But uh, highways and, and just regular country roads, they're curvy as shit. And um, so you can't have a good long stretch of road to really open up that car and, and get a hundred miles per hour and just float through there and, and cover that distance quickly. Some places you're having to deal with lots of curves and, and whatnot, and you can't do that speed. You, it's not feasible. And so it takes you longer to get there. 
But this is something that sheriffs and uh, troopers or highway patrol have to deal with. They got to deal with lots of roadway before they can get to where they need to go. It's definitely not like the city where you can be somewhere relatively quick. And this whole time, lights and siren going on. Um, and, you know, earlier I said we're not going to be sitting here listening to 30 minutes of siren. Um, this is something else that probably some people, I guess I'd imagine some people don't think about it, but the sound of a siren. Like, that gets annoying after a while. Like, it really does. Um, I, I remember before um going to a call and it was it was way out in the country like way out and uh it's probably like a good 10 15 minute drive and i remember uh going to this call lights and siren i remember got to some point where i was just like this siren sucks (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's annoying as shit and um you can't you can't turn it off um usually the state at least in kentucky i know it is other state laws are probably very similar if you're going to be running your lights you have to be running your siren as well um but this was also um a long time ago and vehicles now um the this uh, sound dampening is a lot better in newer vehicles the the cab is a lot more um, efficiently enclosed or encapsulated and blocks out sounds pretty good and there's actually kind of a problem with newer vehicles because it makes it harder for people inside the vehicle to hear sirens when they're approaching especially if they have the radio turned on or something. Older model vehicles, um, you know, they weren't well sealed up. And so you could hear a lot of the outside noises. And of course the vehicle I was in was a, a lot older vehicle. Um, and that siren, man, that, that damn thing gets so damn loud. It was freaking annoying to listen to after a while. Um, but nowadays, like I said, newer vehicles, they're sealed up pretty good and they hold out the sound pretty well. And it's all, it also, it also, um, it depends on siren placement and stuff too. Um, I can only imagine for the guys way, way, way back in the day who had um, like the sirens mounted in the uh, the rotator light bar, like right on top of the hood. Like how damn annoying that had to be with that freaking siren right above your head going off. <clears throat> It's better if you can get the the speaker uh, mounted to the front of the vehicle on the bumper or on the push guard. That way it's not as <laughs> freaking annoying. But yeah, so um, all this time was him catching up to where they're at. So let's get into it. back this up they start shooting at him pick up 
pay attention to the rear windshield and look uh, around the little kind of the middle to driver's side area. You'll see muzzle flash. So they start shooting at the pursuing officer. This officer eventually gets his rifle out. I'm not 100% sure at which point his rifle comes out. You can hear some background noise that uh, I think indicates is him dismounting his rifle from the mount. Uh, I'll let it play and you can kind of hear that. But this officer does end up getting his rifle out and he ends up putting it into play. So moving on. think that this noise is him charging the rifle. It's either gun smoke coming from the rear windshield or it's glass dust coming from the rear windshield.
officer has gotten into position where he's got his rifle out and he now has a clear line of sight he can start engaging he ends up shooting through the windshield with his rifle you can see the rifle casings uh, throughout this where you see him go this direction you kind of see it in the ref excuse me you kind of see him in the reflection of his his uh, windshield here just kind of like how you can see part of his dashboard um, right here where my mouse is circling you can kind of see that reflection inside the vehicle on the windshield but he decides he decides to start shooting through his windshield at them so um, this is not something that can be typically done in a lot of areas from a moving vehicle because of the surroundings right like you certainly couldn't do this same kind of thing in a urban area it would just be too risky typically uh shooting through windshields is done when the vehicles are stopped and you're unable to bail from the vehicle and take proper cover you're having to fight from where you're at that's the typical kind of scenario that you know is playing out or being taught for when it comes to shooting through windshields shooting through your windshield while your car is moving and the suspect vehicle is moving is uh something very rare and there's really no way to train for that because of the logistics and and the reality of it like you can't have um one you have to find a very large track right to be able to to practice this on and then secondly uh who the hell's gonna be driving the the target vehicle <laughs> so uh either a the driver compartment would have to be completely armored um and even then that would be pretty risky or you'd have to have this you know target vehicle remote controlled and um that would be the more feasible thing to do but then you know you might not be able to actually get that vehicle going up to a good speed for training purposes because it would be difficult to remote control a car going that fast uh, location location is the biggest thing so um, you know right off the top of my head the only thing I could think of where that kind of training could be done would be like the dry lake beds out west um, you know, like where the Mythbusters went out and, and did some of their filming for some of their gun stuff, an environment like that. That's the only place that you're going to be able, that you could ever train for something like this. Other than that, training for this, to my knowledge, doesn't exist. You can practice shooting through windshield, but you're going to be in a stationary vehicle. It's going to be very, very, very difficult to practice well, train for and then practice driving your vehicle, shooting through the windshield at another vehicle that's moving. Very, very hard to to train and practice for that. And as I said, I just, I don't know of any place that does that. And maybe there should be. I mean, that would be a, <laughs> that would be a badass class. I'd, I'd fucking pay to go to it, even though where I'm at and what I'm doing, I would never be able to, to probably do that. I'd still pay for it to go to it because <laughs> that sounds like a badass class. A lot of fun. Um, but it's been done before. And um, there's another good video out there. I want to say it's from, ah, what state is it? It's like Oregon or Nebraska. I can't remember what state it's from, but it is a, it's a state trooper. And it's at nighttime. And his car, he has, uh, of course, outward-facing camera, and he has a camera inside the cab looking at him. And they're chasing this dude who, I can't remember the details of it. I want to say it was like some type of domestic thing. But the dude they're chasing is shooting at them as they're chasing them. And so this trooper, uh, you see him reach over, get his rifle out. And this trooper, I think, is on a SWAT team, too. You see this uh, trooper get his rifle out, and he gets it set up on the dashboard. 
and they're going on a similar road like this, just a long stretch of road out in the middle of freaking nowhere. And he starts plugging rounds uh, through the windshield and shooting at the target vehicle. Um, they go a distance doing this, and eventually the suspect stops and uh, gets out, starts shooting at them, and of course they dump them. Other than that, uh, I cannot right now vividly recall any other video captures on something like this. So it's very rare it happens, and it's so rare that it happens because of just the circumstances. Like, one, the fact that police are not getting in the gunfights every single day. That's, that's one big contributing factor. Uh, secondly is locations. I mean, obviously you can't do this in, you know, downtown Santa Fe or uh, Albuquerque, you know, there in New Mexico. Can't do it downtown Los Angeles, New York. I mean, it's just just not feasible to do that. So this is almost something that, you know, is straight out of the movies. But it has happened. And I'm sure, you know, it's happened before. um, But I just haven't seen videos of it or the videos just simply don't exist or just have not been released. And it could, these things could have happened um, before videos and car cameras even existed. So shooting through windshields is not as easy as you think. The bullets go through them pretty easily, but the bullets don't stay true on their trajectory once they go through so imagine if you will you're sitting in a car and you're aiming your gun through the windshield at a target and you squeeze your trigger your sights were set up on the bullseye and let's say you got great front sight focus this gun ain't moving hey let's say let's say You've got the gun in some type of vice or something. It's sandbagged on the on the dashboard, and it's there's no freaking movement whatsoever. You got great front sight focus on this bullseye target, and you squeeze that trigger so slow, boom! It goes off without you knowing it was about to go off. You knew it was gonna go off, but not right there. The best conditions you could think of for having the most accuracy. You'll never hit that bullseye because windshields are a sandwich of glass, laminate glass. And when that bullet punches through or as it's punching through, that medium causes that bullet to shift, to deflect off its trajectory. There's no set rule on it. It may go up, it may go down, it may go to the left, it may go to the right. It's going to go somewhere other than where you want it to go. So the key to shooting through the windshield and hitting what you want to hit is, one, to first make the hole, and then two, send the rest of the bullets through that hole. Otherwise, they're not going to be hitting shit. The closer the target is, the more likelihood you are being able to hit it. So let's say they this, this screenshot you got right here. Let's say they were stopped, right? And let's say the target was right here where my mouse is. Shooting through the windshield at something at that distance may end up hitting it. You're not going to be very accurate with what you want, but you may end up hitting it. Moving it a little bit further out greatly, greatly increases the spread on how much of this round is going to be off once it's deflected. The longer the distance, you're not hitting it. Like, it's not going to be hitting target if you're continuously just putting holes through different parts of the windshield. You have to make a hole and send the rest of the bullets through that same hole so that they're not touching anything and being deflected. Now, we can't see very precisely um, how he's shooting through this windshield. We see it's spiderwebbed right here. 
So I'm going to say that it's possible that he fired through the windshield and has stuck his muzzle through the hole. And I would hope that's what he's done, but I can't say that's what he's done because you can't see it. That would be what I would recommend doing is once you make that hole, especially with a rifle, it'd be easier to do it. Once you make that hole, try and shove that muzzle through that hole. Shooting through windshield is going to create particulate matter floating in the air. Glass dust. The glass is going to pulverize and there's going to be little dust, little fine particulate matters of glass in the air. When you're in a seated, when you're in a stationary vehicle and you shoot through windshield, it makes a, a cloud of dust, a cloud of glass dust. And it it goes places. Shooting through a windshield when the vehicle is moving, I can I can only imagine how much of that glass dust is just whipping around inside like a freaking um you know those things that uh like the little air chambers for like competitions or not competitions but for like um prize things or whatever like it looks like a big telephone booth or something like that and someone go get in it and they turn on a fan and it blows money all over the place and people are trying to reach up and grab it it's just swarming around i can only imagine that's what it's like shooting through a windshield when the vehicle's in motion and all that glass is just going to be just, just swirling all over the fucking place and that would present a problem for your eyes if you don't have eye protection and you're shooting through windshield you run the risk of getting glass in your eye and driving i don't know how fast they're going but i'd say they're probably not doing 50 um driving 70 80 miles per hour and glass swarming around and getting your eyes that's a problem because if you have instantaneous involuntary eye closure from glass particles getting in your eyes and you're doing 80 fucking miles per hour down the road you're you can't see shit That's going to present a problem. You're going to have to apply the brakes. And if you can get your eyes open and, and you know, I've have not had glass in my eyes. I've had sand in my eyes and I've had pepper spray in my eyes. And of course with pepper spray training, you know, you're supposed to rapidly, you know, try to blink your eyes to, to get the, the tears to flush the particulate matter out. If you could try to do that, and get snapshots of the road while you're applying the brake. You could maybe keep your your steering straight so that you don't run off the road uh, until you come to a complete stop. But if you can't get your eyes open because of the glass in them, now I've gotten stuff in my eye before um, that hurts so freaking bad I could not get my eye open. Like it's just it it's fucking painful. Um, and if it's something like that and you can't get your eyes open, holy shit, you're going to be in a world of hurt if you can't keep that vehicle on the hardball and get it to come to a complete stop. I mean, it would be very plausible that if he lost eyesight and then tried to start applying brakes, that uh, you know his vehicle, because he can't see to steer, he could just veer off to the side and crash into one of these trees or hit the dirt and start getting sideways and roll. So if you are going to think about the possibility that you could ever shoot from a moving vehicle like this, I would strongly suggest that you keep iPro in the cab of your vehicle. And not just any iPro, but the fully encapsulating iPro that has little skirts all around the lens, the little foam because if you just wear like regular sunglasses or regular glasses, then all that particulate matter that's swirling around inside the vehicle is going to come in through those openings and get in your eye. So it needs to be the 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 goggle style safety glasses that you know like bikers wear that that prevent dust and stuff from coming in through through the openings. Those would be the ones that I'd recommend you keep in your vehicle if you ever think that you could end up 
replicating this. Otherwise, you're going to be running the huge risk of glass getting in your eyes. And, you know, they're going, like I said, they're going fast. So you put that hole through that damn windshield, that wind is, is coming through that hole at that speed. <laughs> it's, it's a little wind tunnel uh, coming in there. So also generally, um, you know, when it comes to vehicle tactics, it's it's mentioned that you should be doing one of two things. You should either be driving or you should be shooting because you're not going to be very effective at doing both. And that's true, um, which is why, why this would be so difficult to be able to achieve because, A, as I mentioned before, there's no way to train for this. There's no way to practice this kind of shit. Um, and you're having to focus either on the gun sights or on the on the side of the road, watching the roadway. And once you start focusing on something else and you're not paying attention to guiding the vehicle, it could be very easy to have that vehicle start veering off to the left or to the right or something like that. So this is something that, that is going to take a great amount of high and, eye and hand coordination. And it's it's just, like I said, it's not something that you're going to be able to do in most environments. It's going to have to be an environment like this where it's a good, long, straight stretch. you got good shoulder on the side of the road, and there's nothing, at least hardly anyone around. Um Otherwise, it's it's just not a viable thing in my opinion. So very few places you can you can even do this at. So another thing that, you know, probably needs to, to come into topic here is uh, shooting at fleeing felons. Um, so this is, you know, under case law, Tennessee versus Garner. Um, when a person is fleeing from police and they are a danger, imminent danger to society like this, then police can shoot at fleeing felons to be able to protect the public. This person is, is not just shooting at the police, but these people on the roadway, they're, they're realistically shooting at them too because, you know, when a car passes them and is behind them and they're shooting at the police, well, those rounds could go and hit those other vehicles, too, that that are passing them. This officer is being careful not to shoot when there's other vehicles around. You'll, you'll see this. He, he engages when there's no vehicles within his line of fire. The suspects, they're not doing that. So, And you don't know 
what they're going to be capable of uh, in this scenario if they come to a populated area. Will they try to take a hostage? Will they try to get out and carjack another vehicle? Um, you have no idea and you can't take that risk. So there's nothing legally wrong with what this officer is doing. There's nothing wrong with shooting at a violent fleeing felon who poses a, a risk to the rest of society. something else there are people who would complain about the police chasing someone like this take out the the shooting part you know the the police shooting at them just them chasing them people would complain about this they would say it's endangering the public the police shouldn't do it that's crazy to think there are people who are that freaking stupid He said more shots fired so there's a person who's in range of the bad guys bullets clear and present danger to society So think about, um, I, wish, I, wish the, I wish they had a camera view inside the cab looking at them. But think about 
the difficulty here for this officer. He is operating the vehicle. One hand is at least on the steering wheel and he has shot through his windshield. So we know that there's a rifle up. And although I don't know if he has it still resting on the wind, uh, dashboard, pointing at the windshield, um, or he's pulling it down and then sticking it in between the his leg and the console, I, I don't know. But he is also, also uh, having to operate the microphone on his radio. There's a lot of multitasking going on right there. And I've talked about this before in another video. <sighs> I can't remember specifically which one it was, but um, it might have been the, the video where the motorcycle officer um, was shot at. But motorcycle officers have um, a push the talk button on their handlebar so that when they're riding their motor motorcycle down the road, they don't have to pull the little, you know, microphone with the cord on it off the little bracket and talk into it like the, uh, like chips, you know, uh, Baker and, and Pont, Pont uh, Pontrello, you know, you remember watching the, the show and they pick the little microphone up and talk into it and clip it back. Motor cops don't have to do that now. Their, uh, headsets and everything are, are set up to where there's a little button on their handlebar. And all they got to do is reach over with their thumb and press it in and start talking. That's, that's pretty damn cool. And I really wish that um, police vehicle manufacturers would build that into their vehicles. So that um, whatever radio system the agency wants to use, whether it be... Motorola, Kenwood, Icom, Harris, whatever. Um, it would be great if these auto manufacturers had a button on the steering wheel that could have wires running from it going to the console area where a radio would be put in and it would make it easy to be able to splice a wire and, and do a plug and play type of thing. That way, when officers are in pursuits and doing this kind of stuff, they can keep their hands on the wheel and then be able to take their thumb and reach down and press the push the talk. Just like you can hit the little volume button for the radio on your steering wheel or uh, hit the cruise control on the steering wheel. If there, if there could be a, a microphone push the talk button on the steering wheel, that that would be a game changer right there. Like that would that would be a hell of a thing to be able to put into these vehicles. And that would really be a true public safety future. That would be that would be the cat's meow. Like that would be fucking awesome. Unfortunately, um, I guess no one's thought about doing that. Uh, or if they have, you know, they probably shot it down because they said it would be too expensive to uh, run all this different stuff uh, beyond what is, you know, in the basic uh, vehicle setup. And when you think about, you know, these, these police cars, they're basically just consumer vehicles that you anyone else can buy. Like the Ford Explorer. The police Ford Explorer is practically just the same as the one that soccer mom uses to take her kids to soccer practice in. The only difference between the two is the police model has usually a, a better suspension, better brakes, heavy duty alternator, radiator, and there's a spotlight drilled in through the A-post. And the engine is is slightly different. It's it's not governed. Same thing with Dodge Chargers. Dodge Charger that your neighbor has is virtually the same as the police model, with those few exceptions: better brake, suspension, 
heavy duty radiator and alternator and uh, the engine is, is wide open. That's it. The steering wheels are all the same. The, the climate control is all the same. The AM FM radio, it's all the same. So I could under, I could see why maybe auto manufacturers would not um, create some sp different special future because um, their uh, their assembly line is the same for their consumer models, and it would be kind of hard to switch some of that stuff out, I think. But like I said, if if they could start doing that, like that would be awesome. To be able to have a little push the talk button on the steering wheel that you ain't got to take your damn hands off the wheel. You'd be driving down the road and use a finger or thumb to hold the button and you could talk out loud and your radio microphone pick it up. It would be the best thing for public safety. So he chose a good time to fire. There's a hill right there. So if he misses, his rounds are going to be hitting asphalt or over here in the grass and or the trees where you don't see any houses or cars or people or anything. So he's he's choosing good places to shoot. And um, unfortunately, it's just the nature of the beast. It's difficult to put rounds on target when you're moving and they're moving. And... Another thing to think about that could be having an effect on his bullets is the speed that they're traveling. I mean, stick your, you know, you'd be driving down the road 50 miles per hour, you stick your hand out the window, your hand goes back. So I'd imagine that the, the wind velocity as he fires, the bullet comes out, that could be having some type of effect on his accuracy. So that was a reload. I'll rewind it, you can hear it. So he's um, he's either reloading or he's doing a, a malfunction clearing. comes in hot <laughs> and then we see this guy right here so I'm imagining that there's a possibility that he attempted to do a spike strip we don't see anything out here it's possible that's what he's here for actually I'll, I'll try and back it up and can't see So we hear a, a very distinctive tum 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 
it's possible that this officer here is also firing through his windshield um, or it could be them shooting back. You can look at the pavement here. You can see rounds hitting the ground. Shots, multiple shots fired, multiple shots fired. Still shooting us in the back window. Turn it fired. Turn it fired. Now we need some more 223 rounds up here. The vehicle is about 45 off. Step by. I would say that it was likely at this point where they had slowed down and fired multiple rounds that they probably ended up getting a hit on this guy. Shots, multiple shots fired, multiple shots fired, still shooting us in the back window. Turn it fired. Turn it fired. Now we need some more 223 rounds up here. The reason why I say that is because you now see him veer off the road here. The vehicle is about 45 off. Stand by. Shots, multiple shots fired. Multiple shots fired. Still shooting us in the back window. Turn it fired. Vehicle is now on the wrong side of 285. 285. Oh, now he's back over. Okay, he's about 45. And he crashes out. Now, he doesn't just crash out right there where you see the big dust ball. Um look right here where the cursor's at and you're actually going to see him go across this field. And there he is. He's right there where the mouse is at. Circling. Going across the field. Right there. Going towards these trees. Boom. He crashes out into the trees. So I don't know if this was intentional, if he got out of his vehicle and left it in drive so that it would move forward and then he could walk in behind it, or if it was an accident. Either way, that's still kind of cool being able to walk in behind your vehicle as it's moving on its own and utilizes its cover. Um, they are a pretty far distance away from this person now. I think it could have been potentially plausible for them to continue driving through and getting closer. But they end up kind of stopping right in here. And everybody has rifles. Yes. Um, happy to see that they all have rifles. Now, I'm sure there's probably one or two who got out with pistols only, but <laughs> um, that's usually one of my biggest rants um, when it comes to officer involved shooting videos. Um, there's a lot of times you just don't see officers with rifles when they need to be having rifles. Um, but happy to see that of the first four officers I see moving around, um, they've got rifles out. That's refreshing. Uh, obviously, in these this part of the country where you have such long, wide open areas, it's going to be common for them to have rifles. New York, I don't even think their cars have rifles in them. I only think that maybe special units and special people have rifles. Um, I'm not even sure if the standard patrol car in New York would even have a shotgun in it. I don't know. I've, I've, I've never seen them with that stuff before so kind of doubt they they carry the the rifles and long guns but out west i mean it's got a lot of wide open space if you're going to need a rifle in an environment like that a lot of sheriff sheriff's offices got rifles because they need them there's a lot of distance involved a lot of long range some cities have them and um nothing wrong with that uh rifle is still a, a great performer really good at stopping fights um where this okay so they've stopped here and uh where this guy is at um 
they're either going to have to a have someone in a car moving forward and people are using this vehicle as cover or wait for a specialty team to get out there with an actual armored vehicle and then roll up on them um, or they're going to have to split into two different teams and do a bounding type of movement to get to them and be safe about it otherwise if they all move up in a group they could be fired upon and um not be as effective and and start taking casualties so one thing that i if you know this scenario what i would look at is um a team be right here and then another team way further down and think of it like the um like it like an inverted v shape you know inverted v and uh they would start off from here other teams start off from here and they would bound forward this one would move forward most likely having to go down into prone positions because there's no freaking cover around here they would run up take a prone position start cover and this other team would move up and do that if assuming assuming of course you know calling out the pa to them and having them come out didn't work that way, if contact was to be had, um, that person, from their point of view, they're either going to have to look far over here and shoot over there, or they're going to have to look far over here and shoot over here. They're not going to be effective at shooting here, transitioning, and shooting over here. They're going to have to pick, pick one side to shoot at if they're going to be shooting at the police. And then what that would allow is this team over here could start laying down covering fire and shooting at the bad guy while the bad guy is shooting at them and then this team way over here could move in closer and and basically flank them um so you could actually get into some actual real um you know ground tactics in an environment like this uh, that you normally wouldn't be able to see in a in a more urban environment because that's urban versus you know rural is is obviously way different so how you approach stuff is, is slightly different some of the concepts are the same but um yeah like actual legit like ground tactics flanking and shit uh wide open area could be put into play here um he ended up crawling out of the vehicle and was taken into custody uh the woman was was found dead um, didn't specify her wounds or anything like that, but, um, she ended up dying. So I found a couple articles that I want to read. Uh, the first one kind of gives some information about this case. This comes from KRQE by Scott Brown. And it was three months ago it doesn't give an actual date more information has been released concerning an officer involved shooting in Klein's Corners in November according to a press release on November 26 2021 New Mexico State Investigations Bureau agents were called to investigate the shooting on US 285 south of Klein's Corners the release states that New Mexico State Police agents learned that around 2.30 p.m. and New Mexico State Police officer pulled into the Starbucks on Promenade Boulevard in Santa Fe and was told by employees the store had just been robbed by a man and a woman with firearms. The officer told was told the two fled in a black Kia car with no license plate. After the officer put the call out dispatch, New Mexico State Police officer Brian Donis saw the vehicle speeding north on Sorelos Road near Jaguar Drive, but told dispatch he lost sight before he was able to turn around. According to the release, Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office deputy located the suspect vehicle going south on Richards Avenue. Santa Fe Sheriff then initiated a pursuit that went north on I-25, then south on US-285. When the chase got to Klein's Corners, New Mexico State Police Officers and Torrance County Sheriff's Office deputies joined the pursuit. 
Officials say during the pursuit, the passenger in the suspect vehicle fired multiple shots at deputies and officers. Torrance County Deputy, Santa Fe County Deputy, and Officer Donis shot and hit the vehicle. The vehicle veered off the road on US 285 near milepost 251 and crashed near a tree. The driver of the suspect vehicle, 26-year-old Jacob Montoya of Bernalillo, eventually crawled out through the driver's side of the vehicle and was taken into custody. Montoya was then airlifted to a nearby trauma center for gunshot wounds. The female passenger, 29-year-old Christy DeMoss of Albuquerque, was found dead in the car. She was pronounced dead on scene by the Office of the Medical Investigator. On December 6, Montoya was released from the hospital and booked into the Torrance County Detention Facility and charged with five counts of assaulting a peace officer, two counts of possession of a firearm by certain persons, aggravated fleeing of a law officer, receiving or transferring a stolen vehicle, receiving a stolen firearm, and five counts of shooting from a motor vehicle. Montoya is facing additional charges related to the Santa Fe Starbucks robbery. The release states no officers were injured during the incident. Officer Donis was put on standard administrative leave. He has been with New Mexico State Police for four years. The second article, which is the, the most interesting one of them all, this comes from KOB.com by, it just says, Web Staff. Um, created January 12. Bernalillo County District Attorney Raul Torres is speaking out on a case that ended with a suspect involved in a pursuit with law enforcement. Jacob Montoya was on an ankle monitor and investigators were not notified it had died until a month later. Montoya has a lengthy criminal history. Back in June, Albuquerque police say they found him in a stolen car with a shotgun and meth. There was also a warrant out for his arrest. It's just a classic example of the types of people that we see committing a number of crimes, so we asked for his detention that motion was denied, said Bernalillo County District Attorney Raul Torres. A judge ordered Montoya to wear a GPS ankle monitor. Torres says Montoya didn't show up for a hearing and then that monitor's battery died. We didn't receive a non-compliance report until many months later and... It was then that we realized that Jacob Montoya went on this crime spree, said Torres. The state wasn't alerted until December 9, almost four months after the GPS monitor stopped working. There was seemingly no real supervision. There was no real coordination with law enforcement, Torres said. But by then, it was too late. Montoya is accused of robbing a Sonic in Sandoval County at gunpoint in November and a Starbucks in Santa Fe County nearly two weeks later. After that robbery, Montoya led law enforcement on a pursuit that ended in Torrance County after Montoya allegedly shot at Santa Fe County deputies and crashed. Are these really the type of the defendants that New Mexicans think we should be taking a chance on, said Torres. It begs the question, if prosecutors' motion to hold Montoya in jail had been approved, would this have been prevented? This is another example of taking unnecessary risks, said Torres. Torres hopes lawmakers will fix the system during this upcoming legislative session. Under his proposal, based on a presumption framework instead of prosecutors proving why the suspects would be a danger to the community it would be on the suspects to prove why they wouldn't be a danger i handled defendants like jacob montoya in u.s district court here in albuquerque and i know that those are the kind of individuals under a presumption framework they were detained because they had a weapon they had a criminal history and they were too high risk to be put back on the streets Montoya is still in jail Wednesday. The DA's office has filed a motion to revoke Montoya's conditions of release. 
that court is set for next week. Same old shit. Dirtbag criminals being released when they should not be released. So he got picked up for some stuff in June, and here it is, December, he's out doing stuff. He's already a convicted felon in possession of a shotgun, a stolen vehicle in June, and he's out doing this shit. Got out way, way soon after that on an ankle monitor. No telling what other crimes he's committed, they just don't know to suspect him of. I'm certain that he has is, he is stole a lot of stuff but there's no one connecting the dots but like, hey he's a suspect in this shoplifting case or hey he's a suspect in this catalytic converter theft case there's just nothing to be able to pinpoint um, those kind of things and even hint that he could be a, a suspect in so no telling what else he's been doing since he's been on ankle monitor this happens all across the country. All across the country. Not just repeat offenders, but but persistent felony offenders, violent offenders, they were being released early. Too often. Too many times. If his ass would have been locked up, this never would have happened. If his ass would have been locked up, that girl would not have been killed that way. Those poor people in the Starbucks would never have had to have endured that trauma. The other people he robbed would not have to have endured that trauma. The courts are failing society. Whatever who, whatever judge decided to let his stupid ass out on ankle monitor should be held responsible for that woman's death. Yeah, she got herself shot and killed because she was shooting at the police. Don't get me wrong. I'm not I'm not tree hugging here by any means. She played a stupid game and she won a stupid prize. She brought that shit upon herself. But this incident, the way it played out, never would have happened if the judge would have locked his ass up. This goes on more than what you think. If you pay attention to the news, you look into these cases, do a quick little search, look up their prior histories, you're going to find that this is rampant. Why? I don't know. Um, it seems like the rabid woke liberal left have somehow infiltrated the courts and the Department of Corrections uh, in a lot of a lot of places, and even in some places they've pretty much infiltrated the police departments and and have neutered them. But it's it's more or less the courts and the, the Department of Corrections where you see a lot of this stupid shit at. I'll, I'll give the left some credit. They're they're good at lobbying and um, going the the legislative route. They're 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 pretty good at that. I mean, hell, how else do we have these stupid ass fucking gun laws, right? Like, I can guarantee you, some gun advocates were not passing this shit. So, um, I'll give credit where credit's due. The left is pretty good at. Uh, getting stuff done from the legislative standpoint and they're good at uh, getting those getting that stuff done but um, they, they, they've, they've got their fingers too far and it's really hurting us as a society um, it's, it's to the point now in a lot of places that uh, the criminals the, the, the murderers are being looked at as if they're victims. They are traumatized. And this 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 kind of mindset shit is very rampant within juvenile justice systems. 16-year-old gangbangers 
who are out selling dope, shooting up corners, killing people, robbing people. When they're arrested and put in the system, they are treated as a trauma victim. The state will provide trauma-informed care for 16, 17-year-old gangbangers out murdering people. They, li they literally look at them like they are victims. Not offenders, but victims. Because of some traumatic event in their life, this is why they went out and killed Joey. under the guise of providing rehabilitative treatment there is no justice being done at all within our prisons prisoners are being given smart tablets in some places freaking smart tablets so they can check email get on the internet why the fuck does a murderer need to get a smart tablet so he can check his fucking email? That is that is asinine. Like, that does not need to be happening. There's a serious, serious, serious problem with our criminal justice system. It is failing. Severely, severely failing. It's like criminals are being rewarded now. Like, oh, you robbed five places. All right. Reduce bond. Ankle monitor. And if they do any time, they're treated as if they're a victim. And if the police have to end up shooting them, well, there's a public outcry. They're a little angel. They were out selling Bibles. Or they they had mental health issues. And when you when you when you hear people make those cries, someone walking around shooting it women and children it was a, a video from uh, I think it was Denver that I did dude walking around just fucking shooting at people aiming a, like willfully aiming a gun at a mother and her child and shooting at them of course the police got to him and, and lit his ass up people fucking bitching and complaining about it like they could have done something different he had mental health issues boo hoo hoo fuck him I don't give a fuck how crazy you are. You shoot at women and children. You shoot at people in general. You shoot at adult males. That's Having mental illness is not an excuse for that. It's not an exemption from having force used against you. You shoot at people, you're going to get fucking shot. Plain and simple. I don't give a shit what kind of mental health issues you've got. But people say this crap, and it's as if, it's, it's, it's as if, oh, well, they had mental health issues, you know, they, they should have been exempt from being shot at by the police, or, oh, it, it, this, this, you know, these mental health issues, it's, you know, he, d take it easy on them, don't go too hard, screw that. I am so freaking sick and tired of hearing that shit. We have a weak ass society. Weak men, weak people make for hard times. We are on our way to experiencing hard times. Hell, we're experiencing hard times right now. Time of recording for this video is March 12th. Gas prices are freaking skyrocketing 
Why? We have weak ass people in leadership positions. When we were seeing some mean tweets a couple years back, gas prices didn't get this high. Dumbass Putin wasn't invading places. But when weak ass people get in office, things change. When weak ass people are in charge, things change. And they don't change for good, they change for bad. Times are hard right now, but times are about to get a lot harder in this country. And I'm not just talking from the international stuff. I'm, I'm going back to domestic talk, our criminal justice system. If you think things are bad right now, they're only going to get worse. Crime is going to continue to rise. And more and more of our officers are going to be hurt and killed. There is a war on law enforcement right now. Things are going to get to the point <clears throat> it's not going to be a, a pretty picture. We have to make a change within the criminal justice system. We do need criminal just criminal justice reform. We just don't need the reform the way the woke liberal left thinks we need it. We need to get hard on crime. Criminals need to do hard time. They don't need to be going into a prison and being given a smart tablet. That shit needs to go away. When we sentence somebody to 10 years, 10 years is what they need to do. Fuck this shock probation, this good behavior, probation and parole. The hell with that. If you're a persistent felony offender, you're a violent offender, you get sentenced to 10 years, not a day less. 10 years is what you do. And if you create problems inside the prison, then your time gets extended. You want to cause little riots? You want to play some bullshit games inside of that prison? Okay, go ahead. 10 years just now turned into 11. All right, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 20, 25. Criminals don't fear the criminal justice system right now. We need to make them fear the criminal justice system. We need to make the criminal justice system great again. It's time to start locking people away for long periods of time. And it's time to make their time hard. Take away these amenities. Until we start doing that, things are just going to continue to get worse. I'll end it there on that rant. Um, not much else to talk about this particular video. If you like what you hear and see, go ahead and give me a like and a share. If you have not already, hit that subscribe button and stay tuned for more Monday quarterback videos. Earl Henderson, Primordial Defense, thank you for watching.